Welcome back to Healthy Living. Depression is a common mental disorder. Antidepressants do work for many people, but inevitably they do have side effects. Clinical psychologist Bradley R. Daniels gives us insight on depression. Bradley, thank you so much for joining us in studio. Thank you for having me around. It's always a pleasure to be with you. How do we know the difference between just being overly stressed or having a down day versus being clinically diagnosed as having depression? That's an interesting question because the word depression is often bandied around so often in society. People will say, you know, this has happened to me, I feel so depressed. And actually what they really mean is just that they feel sad on the basis of something that happened. Because depression is quite a very particular type of disorder. And in order for somebody to have that diagnosis, there's certain criteria that they would have to meet that would have, tell us as clinicians that they actually are suffering from depression. So what are some of these criteria? So first, the first thing that we would say about depression is that it's a mood disorder. So the major thing that we're looking for is a change in the mood of the person. So usually with depression, we're looking for a lower mood or that sense of sadness. But the sense of sadness needs to be present for a minimum of two weeks or longer. And then some of the other features we're looking for, we're looking for significant changes in some of the following things. So change in appetite, for example. People are either eating more or eating less. A change in their sleep patterns, so they're either sleeping more or sleeping less. Um, change in just their ability to connect with things that they normally find pleasurable. So whether it's activities they enjoy, socializing with other people, there will normally be a significant decline in the person's need or desire to sort of work with those particular areas. Now, I keep using the word significant, and that's mm. very important because it needs to be a marked and significant change in what is normal for the individual. Okay. Because sometimes when we're having, for example, just a bad day or a difficult patch at work or at home, our functioning will change slightly, but it won't be a significant and a marked change. And that's what we're looking for when we diagnose somebody with a disorder such as depression, a significant change in their level of functioning. Now, can depression affect teenagers, children, as well as adults, or is it just mainly towards, you know, as you age, where it becomes a very prominent concern? Depression can, can affect people across a range of the lifespan. Um, the difference is that it will manifest different. So, for example, um, in adults, we'll have a more clearer manifestation of some of the symptoms. So, for example, some of the things I mentioned before, like the changes in appetite, mm. the changes in sleep patterns, um, and sort of the, sort of the, the lack of interest in, in, in the things that they usually enjoy. Now, with children and younger, it expresses differently, so it becomes a little more difficult for that to be easily diagnosed. Um, and generally, we would find a change in behavior. So children will also so show some of the symptoms of sort of withdrawing um, from, from activities they normally like. Maybe there'll be a change in school performance or those kinds of things. And then there's another significant um, thing also to note that the manifestation of depression between men and women can sometimes also be slightly different. And this is probably because in society we, 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 we still are socializing this in, into this notion that women are allowed to express the emotion, whereas men don't. And so often with men, depression can show up in other ways. And sometimes we'll show up with things like perhaps turning to things like, like substance abuse in order to cope with the difficult and sort of the sad experience that they're having in that particular time because there's no um, space or even an allowance for men sometimes to vocalize, vocalize what it is that they are feeling. I think that's a key thing to look at because it's how we deal with the emotions and the reality of our situation. Um, and often, like you said, there's a difference between how people could deal with that and how they deal with it. But the reality is this, it impacts them and also impacts those around them. Um, when we look at impacting themselves, the reality in our country is that the majority of people cannot afford to go and see someone to help them with depression. Either they don't have medical aid, their corporate doesn't have a wellness program. What can they do to support them if they are living with depression? Ronald, that's a difficult one because depression is a, um, it is a disorder that does require treatment. So it does require the, the support of psychologists or psychiatrists to, to sort of help to deal with that. I think it is very difficult for people to deal with it by themselves. And one of the challenges is that sometimes People could be living with depression for such a long time that it actually becomes their new normal. And they don't actually realize that they've been depressed for some time. And those are the riskiest cases because those people tend to not show up for treatment. And until it is too late often, until something drastic happens, um, and one of the things we should often be very concerned about with regards to depression is the high risk of suicidality or even people trying to uh, attempting suicide. So that is the real risk with depression. So my general advice would be that people should always seek treatment 
if they are experiencing depression. Now what that treatment comes in the form of will obviously be in line with what their own mm -hmm. economic abilities and, um, and so forth is, is possible. But there are, for example, um, support groups that people can join that will help through, for example, SADAC, which, is, which does a lot of work with regards to depression. Or if people have the means to seek individual um, therapy um, through a psychologist, um, and a psychologist will normally be a good start as well because that can also make the assessment about whether the depression needs to be treated with psychopharmaceutical methods or can it be treated on its own with just psychothe psychotherapeutic intervention. Mm -hmm. So those are two things to consider. Um, we should also not forget that in our um, government health system, there are also psychiatric units that can also support people um, through things such as depression or any other mental disorders. But the, the, the long and the short of it is that people should always have the support of a professional where there's an indication of something such as depression. Now when I look at the concept of grassroots level, we know that the majority of Africans in Africa, the first point of contact for any health, whether it be mental or physical issue, is the African traditional healer or the traditional healer. And more often than not, when people go through these depression symptoms that you spoke about, they will get labeled or think to themselves, culturally, I'm being bewitched. Surely that's a barrier to getting the help that is, is needed. Should there be a discussion happening with the traditional healers and, for example, the professionals dealing with mental health to say, let's come together to support the grassroots as well? Well, that's quite interesting because actually what we're looking for is we look at the touch points that people have in society generally. And then the touch points that they normally have is, for example, institutions such as schooling, institutions such as churches, institutions such as traditional healers, for example. Those are all institutions that people have touch points to, as well as sort of Western touch points, such as, for example, access to a general practitioner. So we need to ensure as sort of mental health practitioners that the sort of Psychoeducation is also spread to all these touch points because those can be the initial and original touch points that can actually get people to find the right help in terms of finding a professional mental health care worker to sort of work with that. And I forgot one other one as well. For example, mm -hmm. nurses in um, sort of like more rural areas, they often are the only sort of like medical touch point or access point that people have. And it's important that that psychoeducation is also present amongst um, those spheres of the medical profession because they often are the actual link that brings people to get the right help. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're talking about here is having psychoeducation around mental disorders such as um, depression and many others uh, to be you know, present in the schooling system, to be present in sort of like our churches, to be present in other sort of community institutions mm -hmm. because they really are the, are the first cornerstones where people can actually access the right help through a professional like a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Bradley, can people be cured from depression or will it be something that they will live with for the rest of their lives? It depends on what we, we need to understand firstly that uh, firstly depression can happen at any sort of any life stage of the individual. Now if we talk about something like a major depressive episode, generally that can be cured and that will people will recover from that. Now the, the challenge is that some people may have several episodes in their lives, but each contained episode can actually be cured. And also just because you've had depression once does not mean that it necessarily is something that um, people will sort of like revert to or will sort of relapse back into. So it really needs to be understood from a case-to-case -case, um, uh, sort of case -case situation. And this is why it's important that it is, is, is managed and handled by a professional to be able to understand in the context of this particular individual whether this is something which, you know, it's pretty much part of the person's makeup, it's, it's probably, um, you know, that they will have several, have several episodes in a lifetime, or whether it is a once-off um, experience in their lifetime that is due to very specific circumstances or mm -hmm. adversity that basically has um, befallen upon them in that particular point in time. So it really needs to be looked at on a case-by-case case -case basis. But we also have information that says that, um, you know, things like depression, there's also a genetic basis for it. So perhaps if, if there's a history of mental illness in the family, that just increases the propensity or the possibility of it taking place. doesn't mean that necessarily people are going to experience depression. Bradley, thank you so much for your insights and for spending time with us in the studio. Thank you for having me. Now that you are aware of some of the signs and symptoms of depression, if you experience any, please go to your nearest medical practitioner. It's now time to get fit and healthy with this week's workout routine.
I know that the last thing you want to do in cold weather is exercise, but you need to get up and do something with your body or else your muscles will atrophy. Today's workout is all about strength training and we're going to focus on the leg muscle groups because they're rather large. Did you know that the largest muscle group on your body is your butt, your glutes? And with that in mind, we're going to work the glutes, thighs and hamstrings to allow you to get an efficient workout but be effective at the same time with a minimal time period in this workout. So ladies, are you ready? All right, let's give it a go. First things first, we have to warm up. So what I want you now to do are do foot shuffles to get the body warm. Foot shuffles, let's go. All right, good. Now back to basics, I always believe. Technique is more important than getting flamboyant with exercises. So feet wider than shoulder width apart and be going into a traditional squat. So hands in front of you, back upright. Imagine you're bending your knees and sitting on a chair and come up. Ladies, are you ready? Let's go. Down and up, down and up. And this you do for 30 repetitions. Good, up we come. The legs should be burning by now. We're now going to hook up into doing something for the side area of the body, but focusing also on the thighs again. This is called a side lunge. So leg will go out to the right. You bend that right leg and bring it back in. Then out to the left. Bend the left leg and bring it back in. Are you ready? Let's go to the right. Good, relax it in. Now, if you have any knee issues, be very careful with that exercise and rather focus on a shorter range of motion and bend that knee ever so slightly or skip that exercise totally and move on to the next one. The next one is for the hamstrings, the back of the legs, okay? So feet shoulder width apart and all I want you to do is lean forward and scoop up. Forward and scoop up. Let's go. Down, up, down, up. What this exercise does, it allows you to elongate the hamstrings in a controlled motion. There's something known as plyometrics, that's a bouncing motion. This is a controlled movement motion. If this is too easy for you, always push the hands more forward and bring it closer towards you. And this you do for at least 30 repetitions. Good, up we come. So far, so good with the leg workout. Now the next one is of course, ladies, I know this is just for you, focusing on those saddlebags. So left foot bent, right toes on the floor. Are you ready? And slowly lift up and down. This is called a side leg raise and you're focusing on working the side area of the leg. Good, change sides. Three, two, one, go. Good, relax it down. That's how easy a basic workout is. Now remember, we could do hundreds of exercises, but we're giving you a few to allow you to focus on your workout routine itself, but also on the technique of that routine. But you could do more repetitions or do it in circuits. So the entire circuit we just did, you could repeat that two to three to even four times to give you a total leg workout. That's all we have for you on today's show. Thanks for watching Healthy Living on Afro Worldview. From me, Ronald Avergy and the team, Keep warm and healthy. Cheers.